Father, we come before you, and uh, Lord, your word is that lamp unto our feet, Lord. It, uh, it directs us, Lord. It guides us. And uh, we pray that you'd guide us. Teach us your word by the power of the Holy Spirit this morning. Uh, Lord, that we could go out and uh, love others and live for you and be equipped uh, to that end. So we give you this morning that you'd be glorified in Jesus' name. All right, so Habakkuk was a prophet to Judah, uh, and the ten other tribes had already been displaced by Assyria in his time. Uh, Habakkuk had a righteous soul that was vexed by what he observed in his day, uh, much like Lot in Sodom and Paul in Athens. Uh, Habakkuk's prophecy occurs somewhere around 600 B.C., give or take, uh, some years there. And Habakkuk's name means to embrace or embrace one or um, to that end. A little backdrop about the time that uh, backdrop uh, that uh, Habakkuk's prophecy was taking place. Uh, we had previously gone through the book of Zephaniah and Nahum. Uh, Nahum uh, described the coming destruction of Assyria because of their pride and cruelty. Habakkuk is now living at that time. Uh, in 612-609, the Babylonians defeated the Assyrian army and captured Haran. Around 609, King Josiah, one of the righteous kings of Judah, died in battle by the hands of the Egyptian army on their way to aid Assyria. Uh, 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar overcomes Nico II's army, subduing the Egyptians. At this time, the Greeks are expanding also, and they fall in Marseille, uh, in modern-day France. Uh, so those are things that are going on at this time. The first two chapters are Habakkuk's dialogue with the Lord. The last chapter is Habakkuk's acceptance of the Lord's response. So we'll dive right in this morning. Chapter 1, we'll go through verses 1 through 4. Uh, the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me, there is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, therefore perverse judgment proceeds. So Habakkuk puts forth uh, that he is a prophet, and that the burden or oracle that he saw was hard for him to bear up under. Uh, verse 2, we are not told how long Habakkuk had been crying out to the Lord, but his persistence pays off and the Lord does answer as we see. Uh, it reminds us of Matthew 7, 7 and 8, where the Lord says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door shall be opened. In other words, be persistent. In Luke 11, Jesus ties that into, If you being evil, give, give, give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Lord give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him, to those who seek Him, to those who knock, and continue to look to Him? And then we find in Luke 18 the parable of the persistent widow who went to an ungodly ruler and even though he didn't want to answer her, he finally did because she persisted and would not leave him be. And the, the teaching there is that she persisted where she knew the answer was. Not because he was godly, but he was the only one that could act on her behalf. And uh, that's how we are to be to God. We know He is the one that holds the answers. He's the one that's going to see us through. So we don't wave to the right or to the left just because God doesn't answer right away. We don't go seeking psychology or whatever else the world has to offer, as many have. We persist and we seek the Lord. And in His time, He will answer. And He does to Habakkuk. So Habakkuk cries out violence. In Hebrew, the word is Hamas. More like Hamas. But uh, it is translated violence 39 times, cruelty 4 times, wrong 3 times, and false twice, among other terms. Interestingly, it is the name of the Palestinian Islamic resistance movement that wages attack on modern day Israel. And uh, that's why they're considered terrorists, right? They raise up violence. 
Uh, we read verse 3, Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention and arises. Now I've heard people say when they go through a difficult situation or going through hard times, they never ask God why. And I'm like, really? You do that? Well, no, I would, why would I ask God why? Why wouldn't you ask God why? You know, it, it's uh, good to ask the Lord why. As long as our heart is open to His wisdom, right? Receiving His wisdom. Uh, how did we ever come to the Lord in the first place? I think we start to question the world and its ways and start to question ourselves. Why do I do the things I do? Why is the world the way it is? Those are the things that brought us to the Lord. And the Lord's big enough to tackle those questions. Uh, but we got to have that humble heart. Um, so, you know, the Bible says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And that effective prayer is be ready to listen when the Lord speaks, right? So, and be fervent in it, uh, which we see Habakkuk uh, just putting on display for us. Uh, to see trouble or toil, plundering and violence, that sounds like what is taking place in some of our major cities today, doesn't it? By design, I'm thinking. I was reading a Los Angeles Times article on this issue entitled Smash and Grabs and Follow Home Robberies Captivated LA. The real story is complicated. Is it really that complicated? <laughs> I mean, this is where we're at. They interviewed people involved who made excuses for their actions. They needed to pay their rent. Uh, COVID had made times hard. Uh, they couldn't afford the things they wanted. You know, they had children in need. And the Times did not dispute any of that. You know, they didn't condemn it. And so we have verse 4, Therefore the law is powerless, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, therefore perverse judgment proceeds. Along with that, we see DA races throughout the country paid for by many think George Soros to insult, install soft on crime candidates who support defunding the police, all leading to lawlessness. The law is powerless because it is not enforced. Right? Um, you've heard of the law of entropy. Well, here we have taking place moral entropy. Just as natural particles move from a state of order to disorder, societies move from a state of order to disorder. This sets the direction of time. And when it's time for the Lord to intercede. Um, we read in Genesis 15, 6, um, this is God talking to Abraham. And he's talking to Abraham about, hey, your descendants are going to return here. And it reads, but in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not complete. Ezekiel 23 describes the fullness of God's, or Judah's sin. God has his own great reset when the time comes, right? So continuing on, uh, verses 5 through 11. The Lord's reply, Look among the nations and watch, and be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. For indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Um, their horses are also swifter than lepers and more fierce than evening wolves. Their chargers charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. They all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings and princes are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold for they heap up earthen mounds and seize it. Then his mind changes, and he transgresses. He commits offense, ascribing this power to his God. So you've heard about the art of the deal. This is the art of the steel here. But, uh, you know, they come and take what they want. And, um, but you've heard the saying also, it's too good to be true. God is saying, uh, it's too bad to be true. You know, the back is like, whoa. You know, you're not going to believe this. And uh, verses 6 and 7, we read about the Chaldeans. 
They are a brute force without thought for the rights or concerns for those they conquer. With them it's win or take all. And in verse 7, uh, they're terrible and dreadful. We see that they answer to no one and are accountable to only themselves, uh, so to speak. We know that eventually they're accountable to God. And we move on to verses 8 through 10. We see here that they move swiftly without restraint. They do not sway, sway to the left or to the right. And no barrier is there to stop them. They come in like a flood. Uh, they bring to mind the derail choke. I think that happened this past December. It was that unique storm that swept through the plains. And uh, it was widespread. And it was just these gale force straight sheer winds that came on. And, uh, you know, this is like the army of the Babylonians. It's vast and it's wide and it's coming and nothing's going to stop. And um, it swept across the land, provide, uh, producing mass damage, and there was nothing anyone could do. And then after that, you know, we had that tornado in Kentucky that was 200 miles long, did mass devastation. Uh, yeah, these things are all under the Lord's control, uh, like the Babylonians. Uh, we read verse 11 here. It says, it states, Then his mind changes and he transgresses. He commits offense, ascribing his power to his God. So in other words, uh, it could read his spirit or his countenance changes. You know, conquering and going out to conquer changes uh, people. Power changes people. Uh, let's turn back to Daniel. Daniel chapter 5. And we'll read the fulfillment of this verse. Uh, Daniel chapter 5, verse 17. Seventeen to twenty-three. Now this is where Daniel is brought before Belshazzar after the hand has written on the wall, and Belshazzar is shaking in his boots. Uh, so then Daniel answered and said before the king, "Let your gifts be for yourself, and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known him the inter interpretation." O King, the Most High God, gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty, glory and honor. And because of the majesty he gave him, all the peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up, and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beast, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with dew of, the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men, and appoints over it whomever he chooses. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart Although you knew all this, and you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven, they have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know, and the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. But that's a very telling verse in the Bible. Um, so, all right, continuing back in Habakkuk, the second query here to the Lord, uh, verses 12 to 17. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have appointed them for judgment. O Rock, you have marked them for correction. You are of pure eyes that to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and, be, and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? Why do you make men like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? They take up all of them with a hook. They catch them in their net and gather them in their dragnet. Therefore they rejoice and are glad 
Therefore they sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their dragnet because of that by them they share its sumptuous and their food is plentiful. Shall they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without pity? So here in the series of questions presented to the Lord, we can sense the anxiety, confusion, and frustration that cause Habakkuk to grapple with God. Wrestling with the Lord is a form of engagement. We need to stay engaged and not walk away. Uh, in, many, in the troubling times in which we live, they're questioning God, they're walking away. It's called deconstructionism, and it's taking place throughout the Christian arena right now. Uh, they just talked about it on Stand Up For The Truth. I believe what was it on Friday. Uh, very interesting what's taking place. But uh, there's times where you do wrestle with God. And, um, you know, again, Habakkuk's name means embrace. Well, this is a form of embracement, right? But just beware, you know, you wrestle with God, someone's likely to get hurt. It's probably not going to be the one. So, yeah. But um, just talk to Jacob about that when you see him. But, uh, so many of the Old Testament saints struggled with the Lord to understand His mysterious ways, which seemingly are irreconcilable and inconsistent with His character. Seemingly is the operative word there. Uh, so verse 12, again, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. So Habakkuk saying, Are you not the one who brought all things forth and sees all things. Uh, you know, Habakkuk, if not for anyone else, speaks for himself here. You are the God, you are the God I acknowledge, and surely there are others that acknowledge that. I acknowledge you, Lord. Surely you won't completely destroy your chosen ones. Um, he's pleading with the Lord. Uh, much like Abraham pleading for Lot and his family in Sodom, right? Uh, Habakkuk pleads for Judah. Uh, Shall not the judge of the earth do what's right? We read in Genesis 18.25 by Abraham as he questions the Lord. So um, we continue on, verse 13. Habakkuk understands that Judah needs judgment and correction, but yet to go to this extreme, allowing even more wicked men to have their way, uh, he's confounded by this. Verse 14 and 15, it talks about uh, men are like fish. Uh, fish are vulnerably caught and devoured. Uh, just ask anyone who went out to get the sturgeon out there, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, you just wait for them, they have no clue, and wham! But, uh, <laughs> so, you know, they have no one to warn them or direct them away from being trapped. Uh, but you would think with all the schools of fish out there, there'd be a class on that. <laughs> I guess. Uh, a classless joke there, I think. For sure. All right, so men are also like sheep. They need a good shepherd. Thankfully, the Lord has provided them, right? As we'd be wandering aimlessly. Uh, verses 16 and 17. Uh, here we see Habakkuk gets to the crux of his argument. Should the wicked, the godless, just be allowed to continue to destroy others and prosper? Uh, Psalm 17, or 17, 73 addresses this problem. I'm sure Habakkuk has read that, but it's a different thing when you're right in the heat of the situation. You kind of forget the things God has done or said before, and it's like you start the questioning over again. But uh, God's going to bring this to Habakkuk in his own terms. And uh, we'll see this. Uh, so this is the end of Habakkuk's questions. Now he lays it before the Lord. Much like Abraham when he was going before the Lord. And Abraham said, I will speak but once more. And then, Lord, I will listen uh, to what you have to say. So chapter 2, continuing on. Uh, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch the sea what he will say to me, and what I will answer when I am corrected. So here is where we can learn from Habakkuk, to wait patiently on the Lord, preparing our hearts to receive what the Spirit will reveal after we have sought Him. 
And God will answer in some form, in some way, um, according to His purposes. As we wait upon the Lord, we are to stand. We are to occupy, right? Jesus said, occupy till I come. And we are to keep watch, right? That's the other thing Jesus told us to do. Watch. Be ready. Uh, so, useless right so you put a lighthouse out there and it, it stands there it occupies right it doesn't move to the right or to the left and it, in a way it keeps watch right it sits there and it waits and it beams its light it's a beacon to those coming in so that it's a warning call right and we are to warn others so we are to be uh, lighthouses in order to let our little light shine for the Lord why we wait on the Lord, much like Habakkuk mentioned here. So, all right, the Lord's second response, verses 2 through 4. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. And though it tarries, wait for it. I think that's the first time uh, wait for it appeared. I see that on social media at times, you know, you're watching a video, wait for it. Uh, Alright, I'm waiting, better be good. Uh, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Uh, behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Alright, so verse 2, the Lord informs Habakkuk that he is to engrave what he is about to say on tablets, and that's showing that it's firmly established and cannot be changed. You know, like the Ten Commandments. Um, also, it is to be made clear. Uh, so it is easily understood and proclaimed, I believe, on, throughout history until it's fulfilled. Uh, so that people can run with it and uh, warn others. Verse 3, there is this reoccurring encouragement throughout the prophets to wait on the Lord. It is a statement not only applied to personal trials in our lives that the Lord would that the Lord will overcome, but can also refer to the appointed time when the Lord overcomes all evil. So the time is coming um, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. It reads. Uh, I think of what Jesus said in Revelation. Uh, surely I am coming quickly. Right? Kind of the same wording. In other words, hold on, brace for impact. I think of that movie, Sudden Impact. Wasn't there a movie called Sudden Impact? Well, that's what it's going to be like when the Lord returns. There's going to be a sudden impact there. And we better be ready. Uh, we know the world won't be. Uh, so continuing on, uh, verse 4 again. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. One of the simplest yet most profound verses in the Bible, it is referred to in the New Testament three times. If this is all that we absorb from the book of Habakkuk, it would be enough. Um, I think of what Jesus said when he said it is enough. You know, when they brought the swords before him and said, we have two swords here. He says, it is enough. In other words, the words I am speaking to you, your spirit shall hear them, they're enough. You know, and it talks about the the patience of the saints in the tribulation. Um, I believe here it reads, "He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who will he who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword." Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. With all this violence going on, we are not to be caught up in it and be a part of it. Our job is to be patient and wait on the Lord, right? So the just are going to live by their faith. Of all the laws the Lord gave Israel, they can be reduced to Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments can be summed up in two. Love the Lord your God and your neighbor. 
These two stem from one foundation. The just shall live by his faith. Uh, here is what faith is not. Leaning on your own understanding, trusting in the strength of man, scheming, lying, deceiving, contending, and striving for control and power. Pretty much what the leaders of the world are involved with now. Right? Now they're doing their thing. Uh, so, nefesh is the Hebrew word used here for the soul of the proud. It carries the meaning of a person or a creature that breathes, that has an appetite and desires. We call it the natural man, the earthly man. Uh, it is the state of fallen man, the state we are all in without the renewing power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Yashiar, translated upright, it carries the meaning of being straight. They are not straight, they are crooked like the path of a snake. Now it's interesting that the Lord took the serpent in the garden and cast him onto the ground and said, there you will know, crawl on your belly. And uh, so what does the snake have for one of its defenses? Well, it's going to do this, right? If you come after it, it's going to slither. It's not going to go in a straight line. It, that's so you can't pin it down, you know? If it went in a straight line, it would be a lot easier to nail it, pin it down. Well, the wicked are like that, right? They don't talk straight. You ever hear someone say, give it to me straight, you know? And, uh, well, the wicked aren't going to do that, right? They're going to deceive you. They're going to twist the truth. You know, that's why a lot of people look down on lawyers. They, they are masters of taking the facts and the truth and twisting them to the benefit of their client, right? Well, you know, that's called deception. And... Uh, the world loves to use it. Uh, chaya is the word here for life or to live. Uh, the just shall live by his faith. It can mean live, quicken, revive, save, or recover. In Hebrew, it is an imperfect verb, meaning it's an ongoing process. So, Paul tells us the outward man is perishing, right? That entropy is setting in. But the inward man is being renewed day by day. Uh, the spirit never diminishes since it's outside the realm of nature. Supernatural world. Supernatural. We who are in Christ have become supernatural. We're being refreshed by the spirit day by day, that inner man. We're not succumbing to the fading of this world. Uh, I think of what God did for the Israelites as they journeyed through the wilderness, right? They supposedly, as a nation, were brought out of the world, baptized through the uh, uh, sea, and God called them out, and now they're journeying to the promised land, right? They're coming into the promises of God. That whole time, day by day, renewing their clothing, their shoes did not wear out, their garments did not wear thin, that was a supernatural working of God against the law of entropy. And He is supernaturally working us, through us as we are journeying through this life until He calls us home to the promised land, right? So He's renewing day by day. The fleshly man, on the other hand, is fading away, grasping for the wind to find satisfaction. And uh, I think the world knows that. They know their time is short. They're not humble enough to come to the Lord. So they're grasping for whatever they can, you know. It's like a man who's falling, who's trying to grasp for something to cling on to. And uh, it's a terrible thing. Continuing on here, verses 5 through 20, woe to the wicked. Uh, Indeed, because he transgresses by wine, he is a proud man, and he does not stay at home. Because he enlarges his desire as hell, and he is like death and cannot be satisfied. He gathers to himself all nations and heaps up for himself all peoples. Will not all these take up a problem against him? So, uh, verse 5 here, people are no more than a commodity to these evil men. Men like this have always been on the earth. Uh, this is their M.O. They kill off many and then they take the rest captive. That's exactly what's going to take place here. We talk about the globalists. They talk about population control, right? There's too many people. We're destroying the earth with CO2 and other things. 
we need to cut the population back, and then the goal is to take the rest of the people and bring them into their bondage. Klaus Schwab said, you will own nothing and be happy, right? So they, that's their mode. That's always been their mode. And it will continue up until Christ comes. Uh, so continue on. They are of their father, the devil, and are about his business to steal, kill, and destroy. Uh, continuing on again, verse 6, Will not all these take up a proverb, proverb against him and a taunting riddle against him and say, Woe to him who increases what is not his. How long? And to him who loads himself with many pledges, will not your creditors rise up suddenly? Will they not awaken who oppress you? And will they, and you will become their booty? Because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of the people shall plunder you. Because of men's blood, and the violence of the land and the city, and all who dwell in it. <clears throat> so, in other words, payback will ensue. Uh, verses 9 through 11. Woe to him who cover, covets evil gain for his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of disaster. You give him shameful counsel to your house, uh, cutting off many peoples and sin against your soul. For the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the timbers will answer it. Uh, Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but to lose his soul? So they're trying to set themselves in a safe place. You know, we got these safe places today, like, right, you know, like safe places where you're going to set yourself. You know, like a kid hiding under his blanket. You know, and, and that's what these rulers think they can do, right? They can make their fortresses and hide away and be safe in them. You know, it's utter foolishness. Um, Continuing on, verses 12 to 14. Woe to him who builds a town of bloodshed, who establishes a city by iniquity. Behold, it is not of the Lord of hosts. Is it not of the Lord of hosts that the people's labor, labor to feed the fire and nations weary themselves in vain? For the earth will be filled in the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So... You know, Peter informed us, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the work, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up, right? So their other work will come to nothing. Uh, first John says, the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of the Lord abides forever. Um, so continuing on here, verses 15 through 17. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your bottle, even to make him drunk, that you may look on his nakedness. You are filled with shame instead of glory. You also drink and be exposed as uncircumcised. The cup of the Lord's right hand will be turned against you, and other shame will be on your glory. For the violence done to Lebanon will cover you, and the plunder of beasts which made them afraid because of men's blood, and the violence of the land and of the city and all who dwell in it. So Galatians 6, 7, God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that he will reap. So what they're doing to others is going to come right back on them in time. Uh, continuing on, verses 18 through 20. What profit is the image that its maker should carve it, the molded image, a teacher of lies, that the maker of its mold should trust in it, to make mute idols? Woe to him who says to wood, awake, to silent stone, arise. It shall teach, behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, yet in it there is no breath at all, but the Lord in his holy temple, but the Lord is in his holy temple, but all the earth keeps silent before him. So, a uh, man likes to make for himself a God that he can control and a form that, uh, something that he can form as he chooses. Uh, the true God reigns from on high and takes directives from no man. Uh, and they're going to learn that quickly. So, all right. So now we continue on. 
and uh, chapter three, the last chapter, and uh, we're going to read verses one through sixteen, and then come back. Uh, so the prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet on the chicken hop, or however you say that, I'll just say the poem with music notation. How's that sound? So. O uh, oh Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Timon, the Holy One from Mount Haran. Selah. His glory covers the, covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light, and he, his, he had rays flashing from his hand. And there his power was hidden. Before him went pestilence, and fever followed at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and startled the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills bowed. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Kishan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian trembled. O oh Lord, were you displeased with the rivers? Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses? Your chariots of salvation? Your bow was made quite ready. Oaths were sworn over your arrows. Selah. You divided the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high. The sun and the moon stood in their habitation. At the light of your arrows they went, at the shining of your glittering spear. You marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your anointed. You struck the head from the house of the wicked by laying bare from foundation to neck. Selah. You thrust through with his own arrows, the head of his villages, they came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was like feasting on the poor in secret. You walked through the sea with your horses, through the heaps of great waters. When I heard, my body trembled. My lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in my voice inside myself, that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. So, here we see Habakkuk's prayer to the Lord. Uh, much like Job, when he heard from the Lord, the fear of God brought things into focus for him. He says here to the Lord, revive your work. What is the Lord's work? Uh, restoration, deliverance, right? That's the Lord's work. So he's asking for God to continue that. Habakkuk is asking the Lord to do the work that he did when they first called, were first called and drawn out of Egypt and onto himself. Not that Israel deserved anything but wrath. So he asks the Lord to remember his mercy. And um, we need to remember that as well, right, Lord? Do your work even in your wrath in these last days. Uh, in verses 3 through 15, uh, this is poetic language he's using here in recalling the Exodus as he's reminding himself of what God has done in the past. And it's blended with prophetic imagery of not only his time in which he's living, but I believe the future, uh, Israel's future salvation at the time of the end of the age. Uh, Deuteronomy 33, 2 reads, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran and He came with 10,000 of saints. From His right hand came a fiery law for them. So doesn't, doesn't that remind you uh, when Jesus comes? He's, he's going to come with the armies of heaven, right? That have their white garments uh, cleaned and ready. And uh, in remembering the Exodus, it's almost like the Exodus was a dress rehearsal for Israel's universal salvation in the coming days. Because he's going to come from that area again, right? Back into the land with his people. 
He's going to rescue them from Edom. Um, so, uh, Timon is another name for Edom. Paran is another name for Sinai. Seir is the mountain range that is west on the west border of Edom that runs from the Dead Sea to the Gulf of Aqaba. Petra is in this range, right? So once again in the future, God is going to bring his people up into the land from that very area. Uh, so he's going to restore, he's going to redo that work that he once did. Except this time it's going to be for complete deliverance. Um, verse 16. Uh, find my place here. Let's read that again. When I heard my body trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. Okay, interesting, that I might rest in the day of trouble. When we learn to fear God, we will not fear men. You know, Jesus said, don't fear man who can kill the body but can't kill the soul. Fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And then we get a proper perspective of uh, what's taking place in our world today. Uh, let's turn to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, if you'd like. And I'll read a passage from there. Second Corinthians chapter one, and it's verses eight through ten. So here's Paul talking about suffering, right, in hard times. And Paul says, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and has delivered us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. So, God delivered Israel from Egypt. And He will continue to deliver Israel. And He will deliver them once again at the end of the age. Uh, Habakkuk has taken the wisdom of the Lord's words to heart. He has embraced, now remember that's His name, what it means. He has embraced the truth that God is greater than all evil of this world and will cause him to overcome and rise above. Um, so we're going to read that in verse 17 here. Uh, God has a plan for his remnant. No weapon formed against uh, his remnant shall prosper. So we're going to read about Habakkuk's faith here now. It's a hymn of faith. It's a song that he puts forth. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills. So he has taken heart here. He knows that God in his time will overcome all evil. He knows that he will rise above by the strength of the Lord. He knows Israel has been delivered, like I had mentioned, and they will be delivered again. And so we can take heart. And uh, so, closing up here, uh, we're going to look at the application for our own lives, right? And, uh, you know, Habakkuk was an obscure prophet, right? We don't know much about him. We really don't know anything about him besides this book here. And I think the things that God makes obscure, it's so we can easily place ourselves into that situation. It's like Paul with his thorn in the flesh. I believe it's not mentioned for a reason. So whatever issues are going on in our lives, we understand that we can take that and apply it to our own lives. You know, we all have things we deal with, those thorns in the flesh. Um, but the application here, in Hebrew, the word Chaldean, 
This is interesting. It means clod breaker. In Hebrew, it means clod, earth, clod breaker. In Hosea 10:12, the Lord tells Israel to break up their fallow ground. If we don't, the Lord will. In fact, 1 Corinthians 11:31 states, "If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged." Uh, there are times in our lives we cry out to the Lord for the violence we see in our lives, even in our own heart, and we seem powerless to do anything about it. We cry to the Lord. Instead of things getting better, they get worse. And we're like, what gives? And many people can get angry at the Lord. I know I've been angry at the Lord uh, when I went through a real dark time. Shook my fist even, you know. Uh, thoughts ran through my head that, was unbelievable. I was just totally in a dark place. Uh, and it, it just got worse. And I was like, what is going on, Lord? Do you care? And uh, But have you ever seen someone using a hole to break up the ground to remove rocks and weeds? It can become violent. You know, it's violent actions. Pounding that earth to break it up. The Lord knows what He's doing. Uh, we, like Habakkuk, need to embrace not only the Lord's will, but the ways He uses to accomplish it. Uh, like Israel, the Lord has delivered us from the world, and we can take heart. He will deliver us again uh, in His time. So, amen? amen? All right, well, let's pray. Father, help us to take heart. Help us to not lose heart. We hear of so many things going on, even in the church, Lord. And there's an invasion of the, in the church of just terrible teaching that are leading people astray. People are losing heart, becoming faint-hearted. People are not looking for your coming, not even within your own body of believers. But Lord, we want to stay fast and hold to your word, like the word of the Church of Philadelphia, even though they were weak. So give us that strength, give us that hope. Renew our lives day by day as we seek you out, Lord. And if we seek you, we, you will be found. And we give you the glory in Jesus' name.